Well, welcome. We're pleased to resume our series of meeting with organizational leaders throughout the area. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, get to know the leaders and learn a little bit about their organizations, their industries, and these days, of course, getting their perspectives about uh, what is happening with the economy and what's recovery going to look like. We're really pleased this morning to be joined with by Dorothy Severis and uh, to be able to talk to her for the next hour. I'll be talking to her probably for the next 40 minutes and then um, we'll open it up to questions and uh, conversation. Uh, I first got to meet Dorothy, oh, maybe three years ago at a dinner that she was speaking at. And uh, one of those people you immediately are impressed with because of the breadth of uh, her outlook on what she was uh, talking about. It wasn't just banking, which she could talk about forever, uh, but the whole uh, view of the economy and how the pieces are all connected and her background is really impressive. So we're in for, uh, I think, a, a pretty broad discussion for a conversation for the next uh, hour, and we hope to make it a conversation uh, towards the end. Dorothy's got... Uh, an incredible background. I think uh, most everybody is familiar with Cape Cod Five. They know uh, what an important institution it is uh, in the area. She's led that for a number of years, but her work has been recognized far beyond uh, the local field. She uh, was president of the American Bankers Association for a couple of years. Um, and then uh, right now she is uh, also on one of the Federal Reserve Bank committees uh, for New England. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a lot of depth here. Dorothy, I know you from the official positions, a little bit with the bank and then with the American Bankers Association, the US Chamber. I was doing a lot with community banking. I was involved um, somewhat with that uh, at the time you were uh, at ABA, but uh, can you give us all a little bit of background, a personal bio, and how you got into um, banking and some of the things you're doing outside of the bank? Um, well, thank you, Peter, and hello, and it's good to see you, and it's good to see everybody this morning, although now I can't see everybody who joined, but I do want to give a shout out uh, before I do that. To, I saw Tim Kelleher, who's on your South Shore EDC board. And I saw our co-president, Matt Burke, and Dolly DePeza wants to know if I'm still enjoying the symphony, which I am, Cape Cod Symphony. And, um, and I saw Vinny DiMacito, who I haven't seen in forever. So hello, everybody. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk at the end. Um, so uh, the, the short version is um, I uh, was involved in economic development for um, a long time before getting into banking. Uh, I worked for two cities uh, when I was uh, trying to get the city where I lived revitalized, and I realized just how important economic development is, the community coming together to support economic vitality, and then did that uh, for another city, and then I became a national consultant, and I worked with cities and states around the country and Native American tribes on uh, stimulating their economies, whether it was commercial lending, residential lending, big projects, things like that. And, um, and that was awesome. And I was traveling the country all the time. And then we had our son. Uh, so uh, I um, talked to a, an old friend and said, is that job offer still open? And, and went into banking and they said, well, you should learn the retail side. We want you to help us on community reinvestment, but do that first. So I did. And then we, I was delighted we moved to Cape Cod. Um, and I had come there uh, almost every summer as a child. And so I'm a classic wash ashore and uh, had my little toddler with me at the time. It was very, very wonderful to be home. And then I realized it's time to go back to work. So I started as a um, part-time commercial lender at uh, Cape Cod 5, going back to my roots. And that was 29 years ago. And so I've been there ever since I became, uh, I, I then became our uh, director of product planning. And so I launched our trust department and rolled out our internet banking and things like that. It had a lot of fun. 
became our chief operating officer and then 17 years ago became our uh, chair and CEO and president. And I work with, you know, this world-class team of people, some of which you see here today. And as you said, you know, I had the privilege of chairing the Massachusetts Bankers Association, the American Bankers Association, uh, serving on some federal advisory committees. I just completed my term on the uh, Federal Community Depository Institution uh, Advisory Council. I was the president of that for two years and I chaired the Boston one um, as well. And recently, I'm super excited, I was appointed by the governor to the Clean Heat Commission, which is the first in the country uh, to focus on really supporting the, the um, building part of our uh, 2050 road to decarbonization. So um, thanks for letting me share that. And, uh, you know, it's your usual life story. So the you started out working for two cities uh, with economic development. What were the cities and what was the, the state of their economy when you started that? Um, that's that's an interesting question. So um, uh, it, the first was the city of Covington, Kentucky, which is right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. And a lot of you are familiar with that. At the time, it was in great economic distress. And a a lot of we young people went down It had a beautiful housing stock, a lot of it turn of the century, some of it antebellum, and we were renovating those homes. But, um, and this is documented, the government was corrupt. <laughs> they were taking bribes and things like that. So I got into community organizing um, and then uh, the mayor and board, I actually ran a, a campaign for one of the commissioners, the mayor and board hired me um, and we, you know, put the vice mayor in jail. <laughs> I was 22 years old. It was all kind of headbanging. And, uh, and then we organized ourselves and we realized we needed an economic development department. So I helped them hire uh, a gal. And, um, and then I asked her to let me work for her because, you know, I was a psychology major in college. But one of the things that I saw every day is when you give someone a job, you eliminate a lot of their problems, you know, and you really bring community to life. And so now it's a thriving community. It actually has a fidelity center, whole riverfront redevelopment. And then I went to work for the city of Cincinnati in neighborhood development, really working with diverse communities in terms of economic development, and then went on and worked for a national nonprofit. That's great. By any chance, did you know Dave Atkinson? who went on to lead the Kentucky Chamber? That name is very familiar, but he's probably much younger than I am. Yeah, no, he, he's not. He, he was at the, the Chamber for about 20 years and a um, uh, good friend in working on uh, economic development now, he, he left that. Oh, uh, cool. so, so I gotta ask, uh, all that work, uh, any interest in ever running for office or was locking up <laughs> the vice mayor uh, a warning sign not to run for office? Oh, well, you know, that's, that is so funny. Of course, this is not the first time people have asked me that question. And the thing is, in one way or another, I've been in politics literally since I was 22 years old, always behind the scenes or advocating. Um, you know, I uh, represented the, uh, the, the city at the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, things like that. Um, and then um, in the, uh, I did, I undertook a pilot program uh, for uh, HUD. Uh, I uh, taught classes for the SBA. We did a number of presidential initiatives when I was uh, working for the national nonprofit. And, uh, and one of the things that got me into advocacy in banking is I realized that there were some constraints in our ability to serve our customers. And so one thing led to another, and that's what got me into Mass Bankers and then ABA. I testified before the Senate Banking Committee, and then as some of you know, represented the ABA at the White House uh, with, a, with a, um, uh, uh, a delegation of uh, community bankers. So for me, I, you know, the, the best way that I have felt my uh, talents could be brought to bear is advocating for others rather than, you know, me being out there. Besides, 
my brothers and sisters probably would tell too many stories out of school about me. I'd never get elected. Well, you, you, you probably made the right choice if you bypassed government or elected office and uh, can, can do all of the community uh, advocacy uh, without having checked that box. You're, you're way ahead of uh, Senator Di Macedo and me. Uh, <laughs> we, no, we, you guys we, put we, yourselves out there and I admire that, Peter and Vinny. Well, so I want to uh, really get into the economy and the recovery with you. And it, it's almost hard to know where to start. So let's Let's funnel it down a little bit from uh, national and your your perception of uh, some national issues, and then let's get down into what recovery looks like. Uh, you know, are, you're one of the leading experts on banking nationally uh, because of your your perch from being head of the ABA huge consolidation of community banks, uh, which has been a concern to, to our chamber. And we're pretty well banked in the Northeast, uh, but we've been very concerned about this trend. Uh, where do you see the consolidation of banking uh, going? What's the potential upside and downside of this consolidation? It's happening in every industry, but I think there are unique um, uh, ramifications in the financial service sector because of how it feeds everything else? Um, it's such a great question. And this is where, you know, Peter, if I start going on a little too long, you'll stop me because of course I am passionate about this. And I did double check and I asked um, our CFO, uh, Steve Johannesson to update some numbers for me because this trend just keeps continuing. In the last 20 years, the number of FDIC insured banks has actually decreased by 50%. So, I mean, that's a little startling. And then even branches, because you thought, well, you know, they might consolidate, but keep the branches since it, it peaked, you know, in like 2009, and then it's declined by 15% since then. So that keeps going down. Um, and as you probably know, there's um, a greater and greater concentration of deposits and loans among fewer and fewer financial institutions. Well, and like in uh, Massachusetts, believe it or not, even though we do have tons of banks, um, the number has actually increased, decreased a little bit more than the national level um, over the past 20 years. It's declined by 52%. Um, and uh, we are the number of branches per institution also is lower than the national average. So even though, again, we have a lot of banks, that consolidation trend is impacting here. Now, I do have to say something, which I always say as the former chair of the American Bankers Association, and that is there is a need for banks of all sizes in the United States, right? Because my bank couldn't, you know, make loans to General Motors. Um, so you have to have a great ecosystem of banks, but community banks uh, play a really important role. And unfortunately, according to the regulators and the, the research that the Federal Reserve does, 90% of bank consolidation happened with community banks. So that's, you say, okay, so well, what's the problem there? The problem is that community banks actually play an outsized role in lending to small businesses. And we know the criticality of small businesses to our economy. They bring innovation and employment and that percolation of vitality, you know, that's so important to our communities and it's our neighbors, you know? And so that, you know, one study after study has shown that um, one of the things that community banks bring to the table and the, the Federal Reserve, I keynoted their first community bank conference a number of years ago, uh, their research conference, and they came up with the term social capital. And, and I think you know instinctively exactly what that is, that the, the local community bankers know Mary and Joe and you know understand what they bring to the table. And so when they're coming in to start a business, um, they understand, uh, you know, whether they're going to have the character to make it and stuff. And even though 
as time has gone on, you know, the regulators oversee making sure that, you know, we're, we're reminding our P's and Q's about it. That intense local knowledge and passion is in flexibility is really critical. So that's why consolidation, you know, is meaningful, right? And, you know, it, it, when you think about our local communities, the other thing, though, is, um, and we can talk about this more, but, you know, local community bankers encourage board membership and volunteerism and stuff like that. And so that's uh, really important. Now, you, you asked, what's the upside? Well, one of the things is sometimes what it means is like two smaller banks join and that gives them the heft, kind of that scale to be able to invest in technology, which you know we were talking about earlier is so important. We were all talking about, can you imagine us all being Zoom experts? Well, you know, with COVID and everything, everybody's expectations about technology are much higher. So in some cases, it gives some of the community banks more ability to undertake the investments that they uh, need to make. But you know, just circling back to the criticality of um, community banks, when um, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program was rolled out that, and, and was successfully undertaken. So I know I'm not supposed to advertise Cape Cod 5, but I have to say to some of our people here, we made more PPP loans than anybody in our market because we understood how important it was. We threw all of our technology at it. We threw everybody in the bank. People from retail were helping support our PPP lenders. Well all of the regulators, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC, all said that community banks outperformed everyone else when it came to PPP. So when you think about consolidation, you understand why it's really important to continue to advocate for community banks because they, they delivered in the middle of the crisis. Yeah. So, can you give us any sense of what's happening in some rural areas uh, outside of New England that, you know, may have had the two banks and a down to one or the one bank that is uh, closed? And what's happening to those communities? You know, Peter, that is such a great question. Um, uh, there was a study from several years ago, and I, I have to go back and check the stats on this, but in at that time, one in five counties in the country only had one branch in town, and that was of a community bank. So you can imagine if their only access to banking is the local, on a local level is the community banking, then, you know, that spells huge issues. There was a recent study, and I think it was the Federal Reserve that did it, that showed that unfortunately, that um, consolidation and that pullback from the rural areas was happening primarily in areas that were less wealthy, less educated. And of course, you know, you can think about it, that makes sense. So at the end of the day, you, you might say, well, you know, there's all this technology now, you know, online banking and, you know, online loan applications and stuff. But we all know that when that local business wants to go and and get that working capital loan or something, being able to sit face to face with a lender, a local lender who knows the community, you know, there's kind of no, no uh, um, replacement for that. So um, the wonderful thing is, and just to note, um, Mickey Bowman uh, is a, a Federal Reserve governor who was a former banker and a former commissioner of banks in Kansas. She is um, really helping the Federal Reserve focus on the criticality of community banks in rural areas, and the FDIC is as well. So um, just know that there is national attention being paid to that. It's funny, nationally, there is so much political debate on the division of personal wealth, the very rich, the 1% versus the rest of the individuals or families, and I don't think we pay enough attention to the division of wealth geographically. Yeah. Uh, and when you're on the coast in the Northeast, while we do have certainly pockets of, of poverty in communities that are having trouble, it's hard to imagine, I think, up in our area, being in a 
county that might only have one bank. And just imagine that in, in Barnstable or Plymouth or Norfolk County only having one bank. It's really hard to imagine how a community thrives like that. But it's tough. Let's bring it down to New England a little bit. Uh, you had the National Perch. You've got a perch in New England uh, through the Federal Reserve and through all of your national connections. What are you seeing with recovery in New England and how is Southeastern Mass uh, stacking up to that? Your board's been doing some strategic planning, looking at uh, uh, the economy in this area and uh, you've looked at New England, but how's New England stacking up uh, with recovery? Where are the hot spots? Where are the problems that are uh, of concern and how's Southeastern Mass stacking up? Well, it, it's a great question, and, and we could spend all day on that. Um, but, um, you know, at our last uh, Community Depository Institution Advisory Council, that's such a mouthful, but we call it CDAC in uh, Boston, one, one of the things that um, was reported in, which was so great, is there really was good recovery across all New England states. Now, we know some um, states got hit harder than others. And we also know that um, some particular areas got hit harder than others and had unique challenges. Um, you know, Rhode Island's hospitality community, for example, was really, really hammered. Um, hospitality writ large uh, was, was really hurt. Um, one of the things that was interesting, though, is across the board, we heard the same challenges. So even though they were seeing some great uh, resurgence of activity. And I, and I want to remind you, that was right before um, Omicron. And so um, I did talk to our team, and I've, I've got some more current insights, but um, just sharing the kind of the New England piece, the shortage of labor is huge, you know, affecting every part of New England, the shortage of housing. And of course, it's particularly uh, severe um, it, for example, up in Maine, where similar to this, you know, South Coast and um, to Cape Cod and, uh, you know, the islands where there has been this that during COVID, so many people were, you know, escaping the cities, able to move remotely, blah, 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 really intensified that. Um, housing, housing is just a chronic issue across the board in New England. Um, everybody brought up, of course, supply chain issues and, and inflation as a, a major uh, concern. But again, the great thing is, is that even in hospitality, um, that, uh, you know, the economy was uh, really recovering. In, in terms of Southeastern Mass, um, you know, as I said, I, I, uh, Tim coordinated getting feedback from our team just to kind of give some direct insights and anecdotes and numbers about where things are right now from our perspective. Um, and, you know, again, remember November, then Omicron really spiked. We, we know that Delta, like things were going, then Delta slowed things down, then things were picking up again, then <laughs> Omicron hit, things are coming out of that now. But um, so number one, um, and of course, Courtney, it, you know, is leading the initiative in this regard. Um, housing is just a number one area of focus. Uh, there's been a strong demand for housing ownership. You know, you've got um, low interest rates, uh, lack of inventory is, you know, accelerating the pricing, uh, strong employment, you know, a strong economy in the region. And then, as I said, this ability of people to work uh, remotely. And so um, the volume of housing sales, of course, as you know, dropped. Uh, it actually almost 10% year over year between 20 and 21. Um, but of course, then the prices continued to increase and there was bidding wars and stuff. Um, condo sales actually increased a little over 5%. And, you know, from our perspective, we think that means that people were having to kind of consider a lower cost, more affordable um, alternative. You've seen lots of projects where multifamily is really taking off right now. Um, that's very similar to the ring of Boston, a lot of areas in New England right now, multifamily doing really, really well. Southern New Hampshire, a lot of multifamily going on there. Um, and 
you know, in Southeastern Mass, the retail shops are actually doing really well, like Colony Place and, you know, Cranberry Crescent. There's a lot of activity there and restaurants are doing well. The restaurants were amazing this summer, you know, figuring out outdoor ways and things like that. But it's been so exciting to see that activity continue. And that's, you know, um, downtown Boston, not as much, you know, so Southeastern Mass really having an advantage there. Um, the trades are very, very busy, as we all know, try, try getting a plumber. Um, and, you know, that whole uptick in a uh, building. So there's building and then there's a ton of renovation because a lot of people just simply won't move because they know they can't get anything. And so they're uh, renovating. Um, small businesses really regain their footing. And again, we heard that from all over New England, we heard that a lot from Southeastern Mass. But everybody keeps saying, what's going to happen when the stimulus funds, um, uh, you know, kind of abate? And a lot of it sort of depends on, can we, can we get through this Omicron surge? You know, can we get into the spring and summer in a more normalized endemic situation? Um, so a lot of questions and challenges, you know, that we can talk about, but sure. Southeastern Mass is really effectively positioned because of it being outside of a dense urban area and opportunities for, for local work. So um, again, you know, maybe more robust than a lot of other areas. There are other spots of, you know, terrific activity in New England, but I'd say Southeastern Mass has really done very well. So we were seeing uh, with our housing initiative, we were beginning to see pre-COVID uh, the start of that generational movement, uh, early 30s out of the city into the suburbs, looking at family formation, uh, the typical trend that used to take place in the mid to late 20s. So we were beginning to see that. Uh, we've seen it accelerate a little bit. Uh, do you think this movement and the uh, uh, sort of the, the re, re-energizing of the suburbs is going to be long lasting and uh, will the suburbs be ready for it? Um, uh, okay, that's the $64,000 question on everybody's mind, right, is how long will that last or will people reverse the trend and go back? Um, I'm just going to tell you a personal anecdote and then deal with some of the substantive issues. I, uh, while I was um, doing the ABA thing and, you know, traveling around the country all the time and stuff, I kept a flat and I rented a flat in uh, Boston in one of the high rises there. And one of the things that I saw was as, you know, I'd be working out in the gym at five in the morning and I'd see them, the same kids coming down, working out with me. They were all youngsters. And, uh, and then the next thing I'd see is they'd be walking a baby back and forth in front of the elevator at five to, you know, so that it wasn't bothering the other uh, spouse. And then they were moving out. And um, that was a trend I saw again and again, my workout buddies, you know, had the baby and then they moved out to the suburbs. So um, I, I can anecdotally support what you're talking about. But um, yes, I mean, I think, again, Southeastern Mass has such opportunities because there is a lot of there there. And at the same time, you and what do I mean by that? There's economic activity and opportunities. There's accessibility to the cities if there's a desire to do so, but not a mandatory commute. And I know one of the things that you're focused on is that idea of creating activity centers. But in order to do that, you know, you in your 2030 plan are really focused on so many of the critical issues, and, and Tim identified these as well, right? You've got to have clean water and expansion of the sewer capacity. And of course, you know, on uh, Cape and Islands, of course, the issue of wastewater is an enormous issue as well, also just for water quality. Um, but I know that even the preservation of the aquifer is something that the uh, town of Plymouth is focused on. Um, the need for housing of all types, you know, we have a real monoculture of housing and that housing is, is dated and it's aged and, you know, not necessarily um, supportive of what these young families are looking for. And so 
if we can get the sewer capacity in, then you can get the housing in. We all know that um, zoning needs to be accommodative of that. And so that involves getting people on board that this is the sort of you know, activity and development uh, that you're uh, looking for. And you know, I know for years, even before COVID, you were focused on this idea of attracting young families and folks uh, to uh, Southeastern Mass. And you know, again, depending on like what's going to happen with the you know with the T and you know and with um, the connector, that's probably off the board. It sounds like for a while. And so the the thing is, is what can Southeastern Mass do? to create those environments where a lot of the folks are articulating a desire for a quality of life that's improved. And, and you know, again, we can talk about the COVID impact, but um, even as they're reaching those that 30 age, which used to be 20 when they wanna do that. So can you provide communities that provide what they're looking for um, and, to build that, I guess one final point is tradespeople. You've identified the fact that you have to have educated, trained tradespeople. Um, and when you look at the average age of a plumber in Massachusetts, I mean, it's startling. We're going to be losing the entire workforce shortly. So the vocational education, the education, the apprenticeships, and all of the support for the trades are also going to be critical to Southeastern Mass in terms of positioning uh, for that. It, just one final thought, which I thought was very cool, is, you know, as you think about, and obviously whole tech's in the news right now, right? And we hope to goodness that there will be a legislative methodology of stopping them from discharging the radioactive water, um, even for the, you know, the, it doesn't matter, but the PR, you know, ramifications of that. But the plans for that site with, you know, potential open space, commercial and housing, um, you know, clean energy has a lot of opportunities. The Plymouth Municipal Airport, you know, with its master plan um, is planning around climate initiatives like, um, you know, uh, solar fields and the aeronautics that are um, focused on rechargeable power stations. You know, I mean, all sorts of opportunities there uh, that I think is a great. And just uh, if I can throw in one more thing, which is the blue economy, right? What you know, the 2050 plan for um, a decarbonization roadmap for the state involves a huge doubling down on offshore wind, and um, you know the opportunity to support that, create localized manufacturing for that, and all of the economic activity that's associated with that is a great um, you know opportunity, uh, and you know to your point with great uh, reset, resignation that we're experiencing as folks are looking for, you know, reconsidering their life, looking for a new life. Um, I think Southeastern Mass can position itself to capture all that. So it, it's that great resignation that we've all been hearing about and people, uh, new people moving down here that actually has us pretty excited at the, the chamber in spite of all the downturn and the, the negative effects of COVID, uh, I think there's some real exciting opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, we're beginning to see it with new organizational leaders, some business transition, new people stepping up as, as people sell their business, people stepping out, starting their own, uh, mostly anecdotal at our level from what we see uh, now, but uh, are you expecting the same thing? Are you expecting a, a real uh, kind of a resurgence of a, a whole new generation of entrepreneurial leaders, not necessarily in their 20s, many are gonna be mid, uh, mid-age, mid-career mid people looking for something new, but are you seeing that at the banking level yet? Yes, we are. Um, which is so exciting. So it, again, let me start national work my way down. One of the really cool things was even at the national CDAC, what we heard anecdotally was a lot of businesses changing hands and, you know, a younger entrepreneur taking it over. So 
Um, even though we know that there's been a diminution in you know, workforce participation in large part, I mean, there's, there's two things that you know, um, are, we need to be focused on. One is there, there is this early retirement thing. And unfortunately, a lot of those folks, folks are out of the workforce. There's another huge chunk that is folks who've not been able to participate because of accessibility of daycare. Bringing them back in will be important. But there's another huge segment that have left to either start businesses or buy businesses. And that's beginning to be documented nationally and, and regionally. We're seeing businesses trade hands. And you know, you mentioned our board strategic planning session, which you were gracious enough to agree to participate in. We know that if you want to get deep insights into Southeastern Massachusetts, ask Peter Foreman and larger issues. And we also talked to um, folks from around the region. And we kept hearing that about entrepreneurialism, you know, bursting up of folks, uh, you know, buying businesses. The, the one thing we have to do, though, is address the housing problem, because um, I know a particular entrepreneur who started a shop and has a wonderful business. She had a great um, career off, actually, <laughs> off uh, Cape um, in uh, doing costumes for Broadway and for Hollywood movies, came here to start a business, but can't find housing. So, you know, Peter, those two things are so um, intertwined that if you, can, if you can solve that, you can tap into that huge potential that you all are observing. It, I think it's an exciting period. And um, I, I hope you and your board understood the distinction between deep insights and long opinions. <laughs> I'm more than happy to offer long opinions. I don't know how they're going to be backed up with data, which makes events like this tricky for us because we record them. And you yes. know, at some point we're going to be able to go back and say, geez, what did we get right? Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what guests were able to predict five years out uh, with any accuracy? My guess is nobody. Everyone's going to have some lucky guesses, but nobody can predict exactly what's going to happen. In, you mentioned... In oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say in Kentucky, we used to say, don't make a liar out of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the vice mayor said on his way to jail. <laughs> Uh, you talked about social capital. I want to thank uh, the bank, thank you for all of your support of what we're doing with 2030. Tim Kelleher is on our Economic Development Corporation, which is uh, helping shepherd that whole 2030 plan. Um, but I think we're doing it at the right time because it's interesting. Before I open it up to some questions and uh, some comments, um, I'd like to get for the record, since we are going to record these, just fun stuff on the trends. Uh, because uh, fortunately, we're, uh, I think all of us are young enough that we're going to be able to start reading the history of this period and how things fundamentally changed. But uh, what are some of the top trends you're predicting for changes in personal priorities and business behavior coming out of COVID that you think will be long lasting, if not permanent. And you said this is recorded, right? Um, it, so no, I, I'm teasing you. So I, one of the things that I said to our team yesterday is, you know, there's a, a wonderful Native American expression that says, you know, when you put your hand into a river twice, it is not the same river. And the thing is, is all of us have been through an experience that has changed us. Everybody is changed. And one of the things that we have to recognize is you can't throw a switch and say, okay, everybody go back and pretend you haven't experienced this. And so as we move ahead, and so for business leaders, first of all, and I know there's a ton of research on this right now, um, a lot of employees have experienced the flexibility of remote work and more flexible hours. And there was recently a study uh, that was done that said, 
98% of the employees that were studied, I, I don't know how many they had in this group, said if their employer didn't offer them flexibility, they were going to find another job. But I think we have to understand we are in a strong labor market right now. And so that desire for flexibility probably will continue. Now, at the same time, we have to recognize there was a ton of people who are our wonderful essential employees. So for example, my banking center staff that were dealing with the public every single day in person, you know, and um, they went through their own experience. How can you support essential employees who've been through a lot and the stress associated with that? So I think trending wise, employers have got to be cognizant of supporting employees in ways that they never anticipated before, given the stress is coming out. Now, you may want to say, okay, what's going on with the labor market? There's two really interesting things going on there. Okay, as I said, there is there is this huge um, early retirement thing that that has happened. The daycare piece, I think, is going to, you know, I mean, there's, um, in fact, you know, Bob Rivers is uh, part of the uh, uh, of the chamber here and uh, has done a wonderful job leading. Um, the uh, the business coalition on early childhood education to really bring businesses into uh, addressing that. Um, so hopefully that's that issue of women out of the workforce is going to be addressed and not a long term uh, trend. But um, uh, so getting them back in, and then um, again, I think that a long term trend is going to be businesses recognizing that daycare and childcare is, is a criticality. Um, so those are some of the things that I think will emerge and continue. One of the more interesting things has been all consumers, not all consumers, there's no such thing as all, but many consumers have gotten used to the leaps ahead that technology has taken. And so their expectation of every business is going to be that much higher because they're used to an experience in other settings that's very intuitive and moves seamlessly from the digital to the in-person. So all businesses have to be aware that consumers are not the same people that they were before recession, right? Recession, listen to me, COVID. And so um, there is a critical need to focus on technology. Now, I, I said there was two things going on with the workforce. One of the things that will be very interesting to see, and there was just a, a recent study done in the Boston area on this, is um, with artificial intelligence, a lot of jobs of the future will in fact be replaced by artificial intelligence. There was an analysis done that said, probably 30% of jobs. And, you know, I know there's always been a lot of talk about truckers and, you know, that's going to take a long time because there's a physical piece to that as well. But right now, for example, in some healthcare settings, having a human radiologist review um, a, 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 an exam is actually close to, exposes them to malpractice if they don't also have AI review that. And the diagnoses of cancer in some of the MRIs and stuff that's going on using AI is so much higher that you're going to see more and more and more movement toward there. Maybe not as the only thing, but as part of it. So, you know, I know we've all seen what's happened to travel agents and video rental stores and things like that. But as, as individuals are thinking about their job, what they need to think about is, what is the critical part of the human that I bring to my job? So as I think about my career path, what could be replaced by AI? And then how can I map my career path so that I can take advantage of that? And if you're a business, though, and you know that you're going to continue to have, because the demographics are shrinking um, in terms of availability workforce, you're going to need to leverage technology to become more efficient. So, so on the one hand, we have a shortage of labor right now. In the long run, that will have significant ramifications for how the workforce evolves. 
I was going to uh, turn this over to some questions, but you said something that just is going to prompt me to go one more. Um, you talked about the consumer's experience through COVID with technology and how they're going to be expecting some of that level of service with other businesses. I've had a slightly different set of conversations with people. I've, I've had some gnawing concern that everyone's been very generous towards other people during COVID in um, being more patient and forgiving with customer service. And there will be a tipping point where everyone says, no, I've had enough of that. I want immediate high level service. And I pose this to um, the chair of our economic development corp the other day. And he said, it, it might actually be a little different. It may be that uh, rather than businesses focusing on customer service, they have to rethink who their customer is because their business may have changed a little bit. So restaurants being the obvious example, their business, uh, it, it isn't just food, their business may have shifted from that dining room experience to the takeout, their customers shifted. So the difference in customer service may be uh, something introspective about what is my new business now? Who are my, my customers? Which is sort of parallel to your question about having to dig deeper in ourselves about what are our skills and how does that connect with, with technology? But um, do you think this is a period where businesses need to think more about how they up their customer service or rethink internally what their real business is and who their customers now are? Both. <laughs> You've packed so much into that question, Peter. That's, those are fabulous observations. Every business, and this is what I said about we are all different and our businesses are different and our customers are different. And so when you say customer service, I mean more than in-person customer service. I mean, you know, if you think about restaurants and takeout, right, that that's seamless and easy. And when I arrive, they know me and it's quick when I get there. And, you know, what am I and, and do I change how my kitchen delivers in order to provide food that survives effectively being delivered? A lot of, biz, a lot of restaurants have had to think that through. The difference between walking 10 feet from the kitchen and putting it on a, a customer's table and delivering a quality product is very different than something that survives a 20 minute drive that's not heated and not cold. So it's every link in that service delivery, including the digital interaction. Yep. So banking uh, obviously touches a lot of businesses. So does accounting. Um, Dolly DePisa is joining us. Dolly, are you able to unmute? I'm here, Peter, thanks. Excellent, so two things. Uh, so with, with your accounting firm, you touch so many businesses. What is your take on uh, the recovery and how businesses are going to have to adjust? Do they have to double down and rethink their customer service because the business has changed or they have to kind of rethink even who their customers are. And since Dorothy uh, uh, picked you out at the very beginning here because of uh, the uh, Philharmonic, uh, the symphony down the Cape, uh, also give us a clue as to who her favorite composer is. No, <laughs> that's the hardest question. Um... So as far as the businesses go, it's interesting. Of course, it matters by industry because they're so diverse. I mean, you go from, you, Dorothy brought up the, the restaurants, which we actually don't represent, but we represent a lot of nonprofits. And interestingly, they really thrived through, through all of this. Yes, did they have to figure out different ways to service their clients? Uh, obviously. Um, but I found that people gave to the charities they felt really committed to, and they really stepped up during the COVID period. 
and and they all the charities now many of them so educated and you know we reached out to them a lot i did a lot of uh, pro bono work for all my clients just through the ppp loans and the eidl loans and all of that um and they 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 learned how to reach out to their client base differently um you know you have some industries that were really thriving and then you have some you know the health clubs not so much thriving um unless they were really well capitalized and already had done a good job to begin with with which thankfully there are a lot of those people out there but they're still now recovering from all of that um then you have cleaners and launderers still suffering because we're not going back to the office right mm -hmm. none of it look at me i i usually have a dress or something else i have my rainy day outfit on today um will that ever recover to where it was probably not and they're aware of that so they have to figure out what else are they going to do interestingly in the cleaning business the biggest thing that has jumped up has been bedding people are at home so they're figuring out their bedding better they're not doing their starch shirts anymore so you have to really rethink a lot of the industries are now or who their customers are and if they lost a piece of business like shirts, what are they going to do now? How are they going to retool, whether it's their staffing or in the uh, the business of dry cleaning, their delivery picks up, right? So they have the more routes and who's going to sell those routes. And um, it, it's very interesting. I want to also put out there one of the things that I've been learning a ton about this last year, because I have 20 something year old sons, cryptocurrency and giving to nonprofits and how you do that. I've been educating myself in the tax area. I've been educating my, my, my clients. I just wrote a newsletter actually about it. Um, that whole world of giving and all these kids that have made some money, I call them kids and mostly guys in their 20s, 30s, uh, whether it's non-fungible tokens or cryptocurrency, they want to give and that's the way they can give so i'm trying to educate not to blow my own heart but educate whether they're clients of mine or not about giving in crypto or non-fungible tokens and how all that works i know that sounds greek to a lot of people because back in may when my son got involved it was so greek to me the non-fungible token piece but you really have to keep up with all this technology and and what is changing in the world, Dorothy, you're in the financial area, so I'm sure you're reading about crypto and non-fungible tokens and the IRS hasn't figured out how they're gonna handle them all yet. And there was a, a new thing that came out today actually about crypto. Um, so anyway, that's a long way of saying it. each industry is so different, some rebounding, some not rebounding. Um, and some of them you know, reaching out for help and some of them not kind of in their own little cocoon. I find though that a lot of them are reaching their own associations. So if you're a dry cleaner, a lot of them are depending on their, their um, not competitors, but people that they are know in the association. What are you doing here? What are you doing there? What's happening in your state or in your world? I've seen that in a lot of industries, not you know all over, trying to learn from each other. Yeah, we, we've, um, that actually has been one of, uh the saving graces for a lot of professionals during all of this, leaning on one another, reaching out, having the conversations and uh, and learning uh, uh, how to get through all of this. And uh, of course, chambers do that all the time. That's why we bring members, members together. Uh, let, let me turn to Susan O'Day, uh, president of A.W. Perry. Uh, took over the company a couple uh, years ago. Uh, they're into uh, mostly commercial real estate. Susan, what are you seeing on this suburban move that uh, Dorothy and I discussed? She was seeing it more from the uh, uh, the Cape area. And I don't know if you two have had a chance to ever meet. Hi, people. Dorothy. I, uh, I look forward to sitting down with you sometime soon. It'd be great. It's a fascinating Susan also, discussion. This was, this Susan is also on our economic development corp um, with, with Tim, but uh, Susan, what are you seeing? Do you, I don't think A.W. Perry operates down the Cape, but no, no. Uh, how are you comparing that suburban move out yeah. of Boston? It's, what yeah, it's interesting. It's sort of, and this is again, being back to the, the, to the area, it's been about 15 months now, Peter. So not, not quite two years, but um, time does fly. Uh, you know, we're seeing sort of the growth coming 
north, Plymouth has had such, the town of, has had such amazing growth that that you know, is an area obviously of a lot of development and opportunity that, that as a developer, we go in and it's, it's difficult to find projects just because there's so much money there. And, and the, the, I don't wanna say the prices are irrational at all, but you just see a lot of projects, a lot of people seeking projects there. Um, and then you sort of go up to Quincy, Weymouth, Hingham, not so much Hingham, but Quincy and above, lots of activity there and a lot of development trying to think about new tech, whether it's lab works and whatnot. And haven't seen, we haven't seen the projects and you, you're obviously as familiar or more familiar, haven't seen the migration of this, you know, so this out, out of Boston to labs in that area. We still think it needs to be followed by yet. Um, you know, you're seeing Woburn, other areas where you're seeing just massive growth and um, eventually that will percolate to the South shore. But, um, you know, we already talked about it multiple times. We got to have housing for the talent. We've got to have infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we're not seeing, we're not see we're seeing a lot of um, conversations like these and others, a lot of talk around the topic. Recently, some legislation out of the state around zoning, um, but we're, we're in our little corner of the planet, which is sort of Hingham, Rockland, Hanover, that area sort of central. Um, it's a lot of talk. There's some great projects happening, but they are projects that are taking a decade to get through the zoning process or get through the planning process and get through the towns. And so um, the resistance is still you know, fierce. The desire is still high though, not just from a developer standpoint, but from a business people, I think, you know, as, as people do figure out where they're gonna drive value and these new business innovations happen, um, they're not big, they're not big factories. They're, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 square foot, um, you know, warehouses or distribution centers or storage facilities or 5,000 square foot. We see huge demand for office space sort of from the 3,000 to the 10,000. Few smaller obviously, but that space seems to be the sweet spot on the South shore. So a lot of people are either shrinking their footprint We've also seen people growing, the 3,000 people going to 10, but that sweet spot of, of office spaces continues to be uh, in demand, but large office spaces, not so much. So we're not seeing demand for big outflux of corporations building large outposts or corporate headquarters. But I, I don't know, Peter, that was sort of a rambling set of observations. No, that's where we get all of our information just <laughs> from talking. rambling observations. No, no, no. Talk, talking to members, hearing what they're seeing, because everyone's seeing things a little differently. And part of what we're able to do is uh, synthesize some of that to try to get a clearer picture from uh, all different different perspectives. So that uh, that's, that's helpful because in some ways, whatever happens uh, with Boston and the exodus, um, move slowly from a north to south direction. Part of our job with 2030 is to uh, kind of jumpstart that by having different distinct pockets of growth so it's not just the urban sprawl. So we're watching this kind of yeah. scene. Is this and just- And we clearly are seeing foot traffic back in Boston. It's not to the peak, wow. it's mostly on the weekends. A lot of tourism, a lot of entertainment, mm -hmm. hospitality is, is Offices are just starting. I think the snowstorm had an interesting impact in that more people got on the train that mm -hmm. hadn't ridden the train in two years. Um, and, and so I think people tested it because they needed to get to work and they didn't want to deal with uh, the mess. And so we saw a little bit of an increase in ridership too. And just it's somewhat anecdotal and the data should be out soon, but we did see more people on the train the last week um, than we've seen all through the whole pandemic. Uh, Dorothy and Dolly, uh, let, me, let me ask you this. One of the, one of the um, warning signs we're watching for the recovery is potential wealth exodus. COVID and uh, remote work has made it easier for people to move around, work remotely. It's accelerated some of the uh, exit strategy for business owners. The estate tax in Massachusetts is really ugly. The governor is trying to deal with that. And the millionaire tax on the ballot uh, could be another impetus for people to leave. The Cape, the perception is that you've got a lot of uh, wealthy people who retire to the Cape, but um, may be looking to change residences. And uh, are you seeing any 
early signs or risk to the state of wealth exodus, which of course goes a lot to um, community building support for nonprofits. And I should let Dolly go first, but I will tell you one of the interesting things has been um, uh, talking with representatives from the states that have been the recipients of this. So um, uh, Florida, Texas, you know, New Hampshire, um, there are folks who are saying, we're so happy to have your people. Um, I do know there's been, um, so, uh, and, and Dolly probably has lots more uh, data on this, and so I'll let you uh, do it. But we, you know, a lot of anecdotal data of people changing their residences. What is of equal concern to me is people moving the, the uh, locus of their businesses to those other lower tax states as well. Um, and we've seen that occur um, uh, on a couple of occasions. But Dolly, what, what are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing anecdotally, it's, it's always been this area that goes to Florida mostly, right? Mm -hmm. But we're seeing, I personally, anecdotally, seeing more of it. And part of it is that estate tax. That is so terrible. I mean, during this pandemic, we have done probably three big estates and one Massachusetts based, one who owned a property in Massachusetts but lived in Florida, complicates the whole thing. Um, but I'm seeing younger and younger people going to Florida or that kind of a place to get another home, to think about avoiding taxes. Mm. Even in this whole NFT thing, one of my son's friends who's very uh, successful sold a company. He moved to I'm going to say Puerto Rico or someplace that has a safe haven. Or, I'm not mm. exactly sure. Mm. I've got his residence. So it's not to me just the people who are retiring at a certain age. It's also younger people saying, hey, you know what? During this whole COVID thing, I could have been anywhere doing anything. What am I doing in this freezing cold with a terrible tax you know, state? So it, it's not just what it used to be. It's, it's different. It's younger. It's great point. And, yeah, and it's it's we really have to fix this estate tax thing. It's terrible mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts. I mean, a mm -hmm. million dollars is nothing to everyone right now, right? Mm -hmm. Some of your homes are worth a million just without even your portfolio or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, not always in the nonprofit world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me open. We're coming up to the hour. Let me. Uh, ask if there are any questions. It's been an interesting hour. I could go on for another half hour, but we uh, we do promise our guests that we'll keep this to an hour. But, but let me open that uh, up. Would anyone else like to make a comment before we close this out or have a question for Dorothy? Yeah, it probably helps if I do that view. All right. Seeing none, I am going to uh, keep to my word. We'll keep this to the 60 minutes. Dorothy, I want to thank you again. I want to thank you for what you've done for the chamber in our 2030 plan. More importantly, thank you for what you've done as a uh, business leader in terms of community leadership and economic development. Having come out of government, uh, and now into the chamber, I really have taken um, a heightened appreciation for the business leaders, big and small businesses who get involved in their community, who are active in shaping the agenda, who are making a difference, who are working on projects like you've done with the blue economy and housing uh, down on the Cape. We couldn't do what, what uh, we're able to do uh, without people like you, and we appreciate it. And, and someone has told me that before I go, Susan had a, uh, a question for you. Um, so I'll give her that question if she uh, wants to ask it, but I, I do wanna thank you for your personal leadership through your trade association, the Federal Reserve. Um, I think that private sector engagement actually is more important than the uh, oftentimes, most of the political leaders uh, who are trying to move it, they can't do it without that private sector support. Susan, did you have a comment? I didn't. I had a reaction. I was clapping my hands. 
Okay. And I think it was interpreted as this. We need to, I was clapping, saying thank you. Your, your work's amazing. You're a great role model for everyone. Thank you. Well, again, I, 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 want, I work with a world-class team. Uh, you're seeing some of them here. We have uh, 20 of them in Southeastern Mass working every day to support all of you. I want to thank Peter and your board uh, and your incredible staff who are amazing and your sister corporations for the work that you're doing to support the economic vitality of Southeastern Massachusetts. I mean, you really have assembled, you know, an, an all-star team here to take on some important challenges. So I'm just excited to be here for the conversation, Peter. It's always so interesting with you and, uh, and we're happy to keep with our work with the chamber. Thank you. Okay. And then to put you on the spot since it's recorded, post COVID, when everyone comes out and is able to do things, will you join us for an in-person event with uh, some of our leadership? I will. Excellent. Dorothy, thank you very much. We appreciate the hour. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all.